Good morning. I can say with the rest of you, I know that a little bit of my heart is broken because we're going to miss Paul and Sarah, and, and yes, little Noel too. I'm thankful for the time that we've had with them and the blessing that they have been in our lives, and I trust that we have been to some degree a blessing in their lives as well. But I'm also grateful that God is in the state of Washington, even though it's hard to find him sometimes, as well as in the state of Texas. And he's on his throne, and he has something in store for you there, I know. So, Godspeed. And it's also a little bit, a little bit of taste of heaven to have Sarah and Mary back up here, wasn't it? For those of you that have been around for a while, you know how important both of these ladies have been in our ministry and time together. And to have them up here, it's, uh, it is a step back, as Roger said, in our history. But it's just such a, such a blessing. It's sort of like a homecoming. Our uh, family reunion, Tom. <laughs> yeah, amen. <laughs> Tom goes to about six or eight family reunions every year. I don't know what that's all about. I didn't have anybody could have that many families, but he seems to manage it somehow. But we're so grateful that you're here this morning. We're grateful for visitors being here as well. And you visitors, I'm sorry that today we're in a very tough section of Scripture. And as Dr. White has reminded me, who is able for these things? And so we're going to do the best that we can. We are in James chapter 5 and beginning, and we're going to try to do the first six verses here. That James is a, as a fellow, the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ in the physically, that he jumps in with both feet. He doesn't mince words. He's not politically correct. And we have to understand things always in their context. And I would remind you that it is a context where, the, where faith is being challenged. The faith of these of early churches, these Jews that were spread throughout Asia Minor. And the immediate overriding uh, issue uh, is, has to do with pride versus humility. And we see that when we go back to chapter 4 and verse 6. Uh, God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. And then when you go down to verse 10 of chapter 4, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. And here we're going to talk about individuals. Well, let me just say this. Last time we looked in chapter 4, verse 13 to 17, we were looking at that section is people were putting God out of their plans. They were indifferent to God when it came to planning and thinking about their future and their activities daily on what they were doing. It's a very practical section. And this morning he's really looking at, at a similar thing, only he's going further with people that are leaving God out of their possessions or out of their money. There's a lot of that going on. And it can come and get in the church. And James is giving us a warning. It's a warning really about idolatry. Money can become an idol. And very often is. In fact, there's a lot of things being done in the name of Christ in the church today making money an idol. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But that's where we're going. And the problem must have existed or else he is simply warning concerning the problem in this very earliest of church, or church is, about what is going on in their midst and not to be confused about trying to serve God and mammon. Now, I'm going to have to do a lot of preliminary work and try to do it in a, in a succinct manner to get us where we need to be, even to study this passage. So bear with me. So if I have a 30-minute 
opening, you'll understand why. Sometimes I do anyway, right? Okay. So let me ask the Lord to have mercy on us as we study his word together. Father, we're so grateful to have your word. We're so grateful for the clarifications that come from your word, for the, the preciseness, the beauty and glory of understanding who you are and who we are to be in relation to who you are and how we're to live and think and act and do so that we're without excuse. Oh, even use this time together in what appears to be an awkward passage, oh, Father, to glorify the name of Christ and to help us, Father, to understand what is contingent upon us in our relationship with him. I beseech you for the ability to speak, and I pray you'd guard my lips. And Father, give us ears to hear today, that we might be edified today, not to be built up ourselves, but to, that we might better serve you and know how to serve you. Glorify your name, I pray thee, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, to most of us, people who are rich or wealthy are really anybody that has more than we do, if you think about it. <laughs> That's sort of the way we look at that. However, to, to most of the world, all of us are wealthy. There's not a person in here. We live in the land of plenty, and yet, ironically, it's a land that, where we're bankrupt spiritually, morally, and physically. We just hadn't figured it out yet, but we are, and I'm not trying to be Mr. Negativity today, but here we are in the midst of this, and there's a lot of strange things happening. There's a lot of attitudes about material things, about material blessings. The Gnostics, if we go back to the first centuries and that's carried forward, believe that all material things, that is wealth, was inherently evil of itself. And this has influenced what we think of as Christianity. We have such things as monasteries that were built and convents. There were... Uh, in, in fact, that is found in almost all the religions of the world, a deprivation of conveniences. And uh, the thought was that all of these things made a person more godly. And the other side of this is also true. Some think that today the pursuit of wealth and God go together in a type of union, and it is a type of faith. Is there a relationship between wealth and righteousness or wealth and unrighteousness? And if there is, what is it? To begin to consider such a question, think of this. Who is the wealthiest of all? And who will be the wealthiest of all? I hope you would answer that to yourself. God is the wealthiest of all. Everything is his. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, says the scripture. And that's just putting it mildly. And we, if we are his adopted children by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, are going to inherit inherit all things he that spared not his own son will he not with him freely give us all things hallelujah it doesn't look like much right now but that's the truth but at the same time since we're in a context of pride and humility and we generally think of pride going with wealth and yet ironically if we study Philippians chapter 2 the wealthiest man ever was Jesus Christ, and yet he was a man of humility. So that too seems like an oxymoron. And one of the earliest accounts in the Bible 
is the account of Job. And the first three verses, if we, if we took the time to go there, of Job, describe him as blameless or before God he was righteous. That doesn't mean that he was without sin, but he was considered a righteous man because his hope and faith was in God. He was righteous. And yet he was also, in the same context, evaluated by God as the greatest man of the East, or they really could translate that, the wealthiest man in the East. And then you have accounts in the Scripture like the account of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke chapter 16. Lazarus had nothing. In fact, the Scripture says that that he was so destitute that he was fed with crumbs and he had sores on his body. He couldn't be attended to medically. He had nothing to offer and dogs would come and lick his sores and yet in his death he was found in glory at his death. So much for the uh, prosperity gospel in that, I guess. So we can conclude, just even casually observing passages such as this and many others, that material possessions or wealth of itself contains no morality one way or the other. If we put it another way, the issue is not what personal possessions one has temporally. Excuse me. But what is in the person's heart, or maybe better stated, has God touched and changed the person's heart? What is our relationship truly to Christ? And I have already stated that something very popular today is the idea that financial blessing in this life is what God wants for all of us. And that somehow or another, it is mixed with saving faith and is expressed by believing not only faith in Christ, but believing that God wants this for us and then searching the scriptures and combing through them and trying to find keys and principles and ideas and concepts in the word on how to guide a person to achieve their wealth goals. The Word of God's been reduced to a how-to book. How to get wealthy. Just look in these pages and think positively and do this and do that. And everything will come out rosy. And this is a false context. Almost every passage that is used of such thinking is out of context. Promises made by God usually in His conditional covenant that he had with the nation of Israel called the Mosaic Covenant or many other misinterpretations or twistings of Scripture. And may I just simply remind you again that our example, our glorious Savior, though he owned all things, went without everything to save sinners and we are to follow him. And the point is, is that wealth or riches were not important to him in that sense, in this life. He was more concerned with doing the will of his Father. And that sort of gets at the bottom line of things, doesn't it? Because having or not having temporal blessings is not a mark one way or the other of God's favor or his disfavor. Well, if you want to really just think about that, it wouldn't make sense otherwise. If you look at Hebrews chapter 11 and towards the end of Hebrews 11, examples of faith, you have stated people that whom the world was not worthy. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and ill-treated. I guess they just didn't have enough faith, but that's not what it says. It's what God called them to do. He may call some of us to do that. What has God called us to do? 
be faithful. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful. But, all of that being said, wealth, money, or as described in the scripture in the King James at least, mammon, is shown to often serve as a false god, a replacement for God, or a metaphor for idolatry and a diversion from God who deserves all of our affection and all of the glory belongs to Him and not to things that He has made or created or that belong to Him. You get right down to it, Christianity is... A choice. And often the gospel is presented as a choice between heaven and hell, but really it's a choice between devotion and commitment to Christ and anything and everything else. So if, if we are really thinking about it, it's a choice between the God of the Scriptures, our Lord Jesus Christ, or it is a choice for this earth now. which is, in effect, idolatry. Now, without Christ, everyone naturally focuses on the fallen world. This is it. Cradle to grave. Grab all the gusto you can get, because you only go around once, that kind of thinking. The old beer commercial from way back, and I'm sure you kids don't even know what I'm talking about, but... The rest of you do. But with Christ, our focus is on Him. And our focuses are by faith on what He has promised that are beyond this life. That's why Paul says we walk by faith and not by sight. And whatever we have in this temporary life is given to us and is a key word here is a stewardship. A steward ship to be used wisely we could take the time to go to the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 verses 14 to 30 that tell us very clearly about that stewardship and something mostly missed in our relationship to Christ is following him is not again choosing between heaven and hell it's choosing to serve him now or to serve the devil now. Now, Satan wants us to serve him. And he puts all kinds of pretty wrappings and things in front of us. So the first thing I want to say, and if you're looking at the outline there, is that there is a significant distraction with regard to wealth. Wealth is something that has to be handled very carefully in the life of God's people or those that claim to be God's people. Because wealth provides the best in this life. It provides the best in this life. And that's really nice and pretty comforts and pretty things and abundance and, and even power and prestige are all pursued to the degree sought and attained in this life, and it also produces with that or has associated with it when we start attaining that without Jesus Christ, and that's what James is talking about, comes pride with it. Just look at me. Aren't I something? Why, well, I've got money and power and prestige. Therefore, wealth serves as a premier distraction to keep us from God if we are, we're not careful in how we approach it. Its attraction pushes the sinful greed button to the fullest measure. So I want to start by going back a few pages to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 
chapter 6 and what the Apostle Paul says and why he says it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse... Well, he starts off talking about being content in verses 7 and 8. Brought nothing in the world so we cannot take anything out of it either, which is a very practical, real truth that needs to be implanted in our philosophy and understanding. And he says, if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. And he noticed what he says in verse 9. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare. There's what I'm talking about. And many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. And then he goes on to say, For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. There's no way to get around this. And the issue here is the wanting to get rich, the obsession with that. And he calls it here in the next verse, uh, love of money. What is it that we're supposed to love? The Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Not love of money. And therefore, that's the reason in this idolatrous situation that it's the root of all sorts of evil. It is the premier distraction. That's what Paul is saying. And it is certainly a premier distraction in our society that is welled up with pride because of our abundance. And some have foolishly thought that that means that God is pleased with us despite our immoral behavior, despite our focus away from Him, despite the fact that we have taken God out of everything, and these individuals have taken God out of their life and supplanted Him with greed, mammon, love of money, against the backdrop of contentment, and contentment is associated with faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not to say the Bible advocates being without ambition. See, there's all kinds of other offsetting principles and issues and passages. We are, we are not to be lazy. We, we addressed that last time. We are to be diligent, but at the same time, we're expending all of this energy and taking care of our families and doing what we should. We're being wise stewards, and we are content in Jesus Christ. Please think in terms of the wise use of money. Would you turn back to Matthew chapter 19? Matthew chapter 19. It's always been interesting, and there's a lot of approaches to this particular passage. This is the rich young ruler. Came to Christ, and Christ exposed his prideful, arrogant heart. He was a man that said, oh, I've done everything. I've kept all of the laws. Oh, and the Lord Jesus looked in his heart and said, oh, is that so? Then go sell all you have and give it to the poor. <laughs> and he found out he hadn't really kept all the laws at all because he didn't love his neighbor as himself. It wasn't an issue that all of us have to go sell everything we have and give it to the poor. Please don't think that. Christ was looking at this man's heart and he was exposing what was most important to him. And when we get down to Matthew 19, verse 24, here's what Christ says. He says, again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, some people have tried to use the eye of the needle as a gate and all sorts of other gymnastics. It's an eye of a needle. You think you can put a camel through the eye of a needle? 
And he goes on to talk about here, it's impossible with men. Now, all of salvation is impossible with men, by the way. There's not any of us saved because we were smarter and better and, and all of that. It's because God, by grace, touched us. But he's also dealing here to show us the force that is against salvation, that is against relationship with God when there is the idolatry of greed present. Wealth or its pursuit is a significant distraction. Wealth must be handled with great care by you and I as Christians. And our approach to money must be used wisely. I want you to also go back to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30, the wisdom books. And in Proverbs chapter 30, listen carefully to what is said by Agar in verses 8 and 9. Here's his vision, what he wants and his reasons. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion that I might not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? That's what he's most concerned about. What? He's most concerned about his relationship with God. That's what you and I should be most concerned about. That I might deny you and say, who is the Lord? That's what people are saying today. Who's the Lord? I don't need him. I got a big bank account or I got a Mercedes or I, you know, I'm not against Mercedes. Please don't misunderstand me. But that's where their confidence lies. Or that I not be in want and steal. I'm so desperate and so destitute to feed my family and take care of myself that I would have to go and steal and profane the name of my God. His greatest interest and concern was his relationship with him. The idea is to have the right perspective, whether God has provided abundance or very little. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. That's what the Christian's supposed to do. That's the whole idea of being Christian. We're followers of Jesus Christ. And so the Christian needs to understand that wealth can be a strong, strong distraction. I, I think, and here we are reading these wisdom books, which were mostly written by Solomon. And who is Solomon? He's a man who knew the truth. And he became the wealthiest of kings. And you know what? His heart was turned away from his God. One of the saddest situations in all of the Scripture. He allowed his wealth to overtake the affections of his heart. Oh, that's what James, I believe, is warning about here. And he begins in all of this, really, with the practical aspects of what to be expected. If you put your focus on material things instead of Christ. And you have what I have labeled here as spurious confidence. It's a deceptive confidence. And there was apparently those in this church in James that were either acting pridefully in their wealth or envying those, envying those with wealth. And you know, by the way, you can be poor as poor can be and still be greedy. It's not so much what you have, it's where your heart is again. And so these were individuals that James is warning about their relationship to wealth and how they perceive it. And remember that we live in a fallen world. We're not talking here about the kingdom to come. We're not talking about the new Jerusalem where there's going to be streets of gold, but people's hearts are going to be right in the midst of that too. 
So first he tells us, back in James chapter 5 and verse 1, he says, Come now, you rich. Come, that come now was used back in verse 13 when he was referring there to making plans. And he was dispelling the pride of thinking that we can do anything without God. And now he's dispelling the pride of thinking that we, if we get a bunch of possessions that we really don't need God. Strong attention is what he's bringing. He says, you rich. He's addressing those who have or are enviously entangled in their wealth. And they have this foolish confidence that is implied here strongly. Not in God, but in their wealth. And so what does he tell them? Weep and howl. That's an interesting thing. That's the opposite of what the rich are doing right now. They're weeping and howling for how, how prideful they are, but not in the weeping and howling that he's talking about here. And he's talking about in their miseries. It's the most graphic picture possible, and it carries with it the severest warning. He's highlighting this severe danger with what? My friends, we won't take the time to go there, but he's talking about hell. He's talking about hell. You know where there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth? You know where there's going to be misery beyond, beyond description is in hell? And James is talking about this danger, this view of hell. It feels like right now that you're sort of in, in a, a sort of semi-heaven because you have all of these pleasures and all of these things. This should remind us of Luke 16, the rich man and Lazarus. He was deceived by having his good things in this life, given the explanation of Christ, but it ended with his complete misery in Hades. He was begging that a drop of water, uh, just a drop of water, could be placed on my tongue. This is weeping and howling. And we're reminded of the words of our Lord Jesus, Mark 8, 36. What does it profit a man? if he gains the whole world and loses his soul. And that should be something that should be a bumper sticker in front of your face as you consider your stewardship and I consider my stewardship because Christ said no one can serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and money. You can't serve God and wealth. He talks, and, and we've been all through this, and you know it, that, that the things of the world, and that's right at the top of the chart of the things of this world, the thinking of the world system is to get it all right now and climb to the top of the heap and be better than everybody up and down the street as far as things and, and to be parading our things around You either have allegiance to wealth or you have allegiance to Christ. You can't have allegiance to both. Now again, put that in the perspective of many other things where we have responsibilities to take care of and so forth, but that's not where our hope and confidence rest. And that's not where our focus is. And so he goes on to say in verse 2 and 3, what is the outcome of those who put their trust, their confidence, their focus of life into riches? He says, your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. The characteristic of the rich, and especially it was obvious in that day, was that they dressed in fine clothes, while others were walking around in rags, as it were. And they had gold and silver. But he says in verse 3, Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust 
will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. This idea of gold and silver and garments and possessions, all of this as becoming not only worthless, but ultimately detestable to you because you put your confidence in it. And the idea of rust there is their ruin will be a witness against them. Why? Because these have become idols. Just as having in the Old Testament the physical idols that individuals made little images and golden calves and whatever to serve and bow down before them that the Lord made fun of in Isaiah 40 because they were worthless and useless. They will serve in this context as a witness against them. And we might think of of um, Naboth. Remember him when he, or excuse me, I'm not, not Naboth, but Achan, when he hid his idols in the tent when Joshua and the Israelites had just entered the promised land and they were going up against Ai. Those idols that he hid in his tent which caused the defeat of Israel, God was so serious about it, became a witness against him. And he's saying in the day of judgment, which is what he's going to talk about next, these things will serve as a witness against you. If that's where your confidence lies. Because it's someone that has preferred wealth to Christ. Someone who's placed the focus of their life and the love of their life in things, not on God, but in what they could accumulate. And this last days, this last days is a reference, I believe, in this context that you have stored up your treasure is a reference to the fact that what's going to happen in the last days? Christ is coming in judgment. That's what he's talking about here. This whole context is about judgment of those that have turned their allegiance away from Christ. And it's that warning that is there. Beginning in verse 4 and through 6, he also talks about its selfish and evil use, a misuse of what God has provided. Notice, behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. Here is wealth being used not in a stewardship form and it ultimately reflects the greediness the miserliness, the stinginess of the individuals that move in this direction. A witness to that. Their lust for, for wealth. So lustful for wealth. So focused on money that they're willing really to steal from others. And, and theft goes on at every level. And people think nothing about it. The poor man stealing from somebody else out of hatred and jealousy and disgust. Our own government really stealing. And their motivation is to fleece the people. Because those who seek wealth have an evil heart. And they don't seek wealth to help others. And I know some people claim that, but they don't. It never happens that way. They don't love money. I mean, they don't love the people. They love the money. They're not benevolent, really, unless it's something, and there's some benevolent, wealthy people, and often their benevolence is to show off, and we'll see that in a minute. But here it's been withheld. You've cheated others. 
who could not defend themselves. But the real issue here is that it has reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabaoth. The Lord, really that word Sabaoth is host. It's the Lord of armies. And Christ came the first time as this mild little poor baby in a manger and grew up being despised and, and rejected and, and every sense of the word, but that's not why he's coming back the second time in the end of days. He's coming back as the Lord of hosts. Who can stand before him? Only those who are washed in his blood. And that's what he's referring to here. And he says in verse 5, you have lived luxuriously on the earth. This is the only place that that word luxuriously is used in the New Testament. And it's a word that means to live indulgently. Over the top, in other words, for self. And it becomes the exhibit A of living only for self. No regard for God and no regard for others. And what are they really doing here? It says you've led a life of wanton pleasure. Again, over the top. It, it, your focus is all on the immediate here and now. And full of pride, you think that I am worth it, you know. I deserve this. Nobody else does, but I do. And no thought of God. He's not in the picture. And what have you really done, he says? You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. The picture here is some of the cattle, a beast, that gets put in a pen or something, and they're just fed corn and grain, and they just poop, poop, poop. They're getting swole up for the slaughter. And they have not a clue that that's what's going on. And this is the ugly, ugly picture of someone focused on things and focused on themselves and leaving God entirely out of the picture. They're being fattened up for the slaughter. God help us. I hope you see how brutal James approaches this, and I believe he does so because it's a brutal subject. It needs to be exposed the way he's exposing it, or it wouldn't be. It's in the direction and spirit of God. What a horrible, deceptive picture this is. And with that also wealth brings with it, and especially in that day and time, but also today, he says in verse 6, you have condemned and put to death the righteous man he does not resist you. Power, possessions, prominence, you can use all the P's, they go together. And many people want wealth because they want power, and they're consumed with power, influence. They want to control everyone else and fleece everyone else and take from everyone else and put them down to raise themselves up. And that's what these are con have done. They, you have condemned and put to death the righteous. Is that not so? In the history of this world, these dictators and these ungodly men have slaughtered God's people. It wasn't, you know, a couple of years ago that I was in Israel and there at uh, Ben, uh, I can't think of the name, but there was the arena there, the ruins of that, where many, many thousands of Christians were put to death for their faith by the Roman Empire. And I don't think we're aware of the fact that many are being put to death today for their faith around this world. Individuals that have no view of God, only views of themselves 
in their pride thinking they could get away with slaughtering God's people who are the apple of his eye. And we think of Luke chapter 12, verse 48, for whom much is given, much is required. And that brings it back to home here. Because everybody in here has been given much. Is that not so? I don't think there's hardly a person in the United States of America unless somebody just wants to be out on the street or something that doesn't have a big screen TV, a cell phone, an automobile, and an air conditioner whom much is given. Now, I'm not for getting rid of those things. That's, please don't somebody think that. For whom much is given, much is required. And in this context, it's also important to see what these wealthy did with their wealth, but also what they did not do with their wealth. There's some things missing here, in other words. What do we see missing here? Well, let me put up number one on the chart, and we could preach messages about this. Where do we see gratitude? Gratitude. Where do we see gratitude? Romans chapter 1, when it's talking about the spiraling down of God gave them over, right at the top of the chart, is neither were they thankful. They're like a hog eating a slop, but they don't look up and say, thank you. They're incapable of saying thankful. They're incapable of gratitude. Where's their charity? Where's their concern for others? Love your neighbor as yourself. Where is their concern for the brevity of life? It's like they have eyes that are blind, that cannot see that there's an end in all this, and what's on the other side of that end? The complete absence of the fear of the Lord. All of that is missing here, brethren. And my question for you and my question for me is how powerful are those things in our life? The Christian is said to be one that overcomes the world. And right at the the top of the chart of things to overcome is this whole business of wealth. And we can see it in Hollywood. We can see it around us. Individuals that are walking around in their pride And we should feel sorry for them. Don't look at them with eyes of envy, but eyes of sorrow. Because it's all temporary and it's all going to come crashing down. And that's what James is saying here. Now in conclusion, can one be wealthy and know God? Yes. Yes. And we sang the hymn a while ago. I'm almost tempted to break out in song. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Is that your heart? So that no matter what else you have, you have Jesus. And guess what? If you have Jesus, or He has you, as we said this morning, that's really where we're coming from. It's a mutual thing. We love because He first loved us. Amen? But if you have Jesus, you have everything. You have everything. I don't care what's going on in your life. I know some of you are hurting and some of you are worried and some of you are troubled and some of you are diseased and some of you are this and that and the other. But if you have Jesus, (laughs) you have everything. And if you don't have Jesus, I don't care how smooth your highway appears at the moment, it's going to come to a crashing end. Do you see that? Do you understand that? 
In closing, look with me at Psalm 73, and we'll stop there. Here is this psalmist Asaph. And notice what he says in Psalm 73. Verses 1 to 3, he says, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, here's his true confession, My feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. Why? For I was envious of the arrogant, and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And he goes on here, if you, for example, in verses 5 to 8, he talks about looking at the wealthy at the materialist of his day, he says, they're not in trouble as other men, or are they plagued like mankind? Their pride is in their, there's that pride word again, in their necklace, their, the garment of violence covers them. Here's their heart, always causing trouble. Their eyes bulges with fatness. Their, the imagination of their heart run riot. They can just do anything they want to do when they want to do it. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high in the highest positions. They've got it made in the shade. And so the psalmist is admitting. He looked at that and he's going to go on to say, well, you know, I begin to wonder, what does, it, what does it do to follow God? Is it worth anything to follow God? After all, these people have got it made and I'm over here, I've got all kinds of worries and concerns and problems and, and I'm just barely getting by and I'm scraping the bottom and all that. But then you go down to verses 17 and 18. Until I came into the sanctuary of God. Now that would be commensurate with the word of God in that day. Then I perceived their end. That's what James is doing. Surely you set them in slippery places. My friend, materialism is a slippery place. It's a deceptive place. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream when one awakes. To be wealthy and leave God out is just like living in some sort of silly dream. Think about that. And you're going to have to wake up. Because that's exactly what the psalmist here says, and when he gets down to verse 25, he's got his head straight again. Whom have I in heaven but you, and besides you? I desire nothing on the earth. Fooey on all this. I want Christ. In verse 28, but as for me, the nearness of my God is my good. That's all I need. You got God, you got Christ, you have everything. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. That's what we're supposed to be about, is proclaiming Him and boasting in Him, that others might see and know Him. That is truly what it's all about. Wealth is a fulfillment or can be a fulfillment of pride. And it can produce envy in us. And we can start thinking we're missing out. But it ultimately will lead blindly and headlong into a judgment that is just the opposite of what it appears. And just because we're in church here and bear the name of Christian doesn't mean that we're exempt from the idol of money. In fact, there are churches that are promoting the idol of money, which is really ironic, in the name of Christ. I hope you know that and realize it. And the point is, seek Christ alone. Place your faith exclusively in Him. Cling exclusively to Him. Because I say again, hallelujah, if you have Christ, you have everything. You have everything. Do you think that there's one of these promises that He has made to you that's not going to be fulfilled? 
You think there's one that's going to slip through the, tra the crack or he just really didn't mean this? Did Christ die on the cross? The one who made everything died on behalf of sinners. And He said, He that did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, will He not with Him freely give us all things? Be patient, my friend, unto the coming of the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father, we're so grateful to have your word. We're so grateful to have your Son. Or rather that he has us. And we beseech you to forgive us when at any level we begin to get sidetracked and start thinking in terms of replacing our allegiance to you with something else. Oh, Lord, spare the flock that is here. Spare us, Father. Help the little ears that are here to hear. And help us all to hear. And help us, Father, to measure things according to your word and not according to the popularity and the, the movement and pressure of the day in which we live, but only according to truth. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.